Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to another wonderful session. We are super excited today to have our next presenter with us. Our next presenter is Mila, and she has been in education for over 20 years of experience in fulfilling a variety of roles in early childhood education. Her passion is to promote and provide training sessions that help teachers to learn and gain knowledge of child development, to meet the needs of children and to grow professionally. So we're super excited for Mila to be here with us today. Next slide, please. I want to give you just a few minutes to go ahead and look at this disclaimer. Next slide, please. One more disclaimer before we get started. All right, Mila, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Tisha, for the grand introduction. And I want to welcome everyone to my session today, Meaningful Engagement and Interaction, Developing Language and Literacy Skills in Young Children. As early childhood teachers, professionals, students, you all know what an integral role inter interaction or um, engagement uh, plays a role in developing language and literacy and vocabulary in young children. So what are some of the strategies that you are currently using to help children acquire language skills? Just kind of let's think for a little bit, a few seconds maybe. Um, you all are using something and you are um, you know, very, very conversant with what you are doing every day in your classroom to help these children on their onward journey towards language development. And some of the things that we may be doing are like reading stories, having them prompt them to retell the stories, puppets, uh, you know, um, playing in the home living area. Circle time is a great option for you. Even transition activities, you know, like we say, it's a teachable moment grab every opportunity that you have and an ongoing back and forth conversation is a very, very important part of our everyday classroom uh, routine and schedule. So if we look at the language skill uh, development acquisition from birth to five years and just taking it, you know, looking at it at a glance, we see, you know, at the very beginning at about three months of age, Kids are basically, they, they just kind of get aware of the environment around and they're just cooing and making different sounds and gargling. Sometimes, you know, this is their way, their first attempt to get your attention, to be getting acquainted with the world around. At about six months of age, then the kids gradually go into some sounds, which may not make sense. But if you look at it and think about it, this is their first attempt that they're making some consistent efforts to communicate with you at 12 months of age, not that it um, you know, specifically fits all children, as we know very well that children develop at their own pace and own, own rate. So at 12 months, generally, they'll be uttering a few words. And amazingly, by the time they're 18 months old, they know from five to 40 words. Isn't that amazing? just to think about the, the progression of the language development. And by two years of age, another great fit, 150 to 300 words. And they're even uh, able to say two to three word sentences. So if we kind of look back at it and, and think about the role we play as teachers, caregivers, parents in this onward journey with the children that we take care of and serve. So by three years, they have a vocabulary of almost 900 to 1000 words. And they're able to not only comprehend questions, but also to be able to ask some specific questions. By four years, vocabulary increases amazingly to 2000 words and five word sentences, which is like almost speaking as a adults. By five years, they're able to identify letters and they can, they're able to, you know, orally communicate with you in longer, meaningful sentences. So this is something, it's in a nutshell, but it honestly makes us think that how do these kids 
acquire their language skills at that amazing rate. So some of the things that we want to, and we know as part of early childhood development, that the brain uh, through the first five years, it goes through a rapid growth level. So the child's brain doubles in size during the first year. And then the language and the literacy um, or the, the, the acquisition of vocabulary and language literacy, it starts forming during the first three years of age. And there, by age three, it is twice as an active as an adult. I mean, just think about it how many neurons are connecting in their brain and the kid's brain is almost like amazing what goes in there. And when they are acquiring that knowledge using their senses. So it's very important for us to be able to provide the children with um, activities, with experiences that helps them to absorb through their five senses. And early childhood experience plays an integral and um, integral and vital role. And as well as how responsive are we as adults providing the care that we are providing to these young children. And all these experiences combined with the rapid growth of the brain has a significant effect on the language and uh, vocabulary skill development in young children. So the first year, which we call as pre-linguistic stage, what they're doing basically, like we just said, making gestures, eye contacts, uh, even a little bit older, pointing, babbling, cooing, these are the norms, or these are some of the telltale things that we observe in each child, that they are trying to make communication having them, you know, making, being aware of the environment around them. So in that case, you know, how we stage and have the environment set is also a very important part. And by the holophrase stage is between 10 and 13 months. And they may be using, like we just, we said before, a few words. There may be still kind of nonverbal cues at this point. Um, they're making communication, but their verbal skill is still at a developmental stage and they are using words, but still there is not that you know, greater fluency in there. The two word sentences start by like about almost like 18 months. Um, there is like, maybe they're trying to make the meaning. They're able to communicate with you some action words, some names, naming objects, naming someone in particular, and also they're still using their nonverbal communication skills. And then they're becoming more and more aware of their environment and picking up cues and, and accordingly able to apply it effectively to communicate. Multiple word sentences, this, is, this develops usually between the ages of two and two and a half complete sentences. And the sentences may still sound a little bit off but actually they are able to communicate. You are able to understand what they're trying to tell you. And again, I would say the same thing that you are us as caregivers, parents, at this, you know, throughout these stages, we are there working with them, providing them the, the environment, the interaction, the experiences, the activities that kind of help these children to learn gradually this skill towards vocabulary and language skill development. More complex grammatical structures are formed between the ages of two and a half and three. So there's more complex sentences. They can add more to the sentence and add or express themselves a little more in details. That's what we see in, an, in that age between two and a half and three. Adult-like language structure uh, amazingly starts between the ages of five and six. And they're able to use the correct, um, use not only the use of words in sentences, but they're also able to use it in the correct order. And sometimes if you're working directly with children every day, you are amazed to see some children, they are able to express themselves so much in details, you know, you can almost like visually see them what they're saying, you know, and that is amazing. 
And um, so understanding how um, language and literacy are this stage develops between nine to 36 months, they are able to understand, they're able to comprehend, they're able to respond effectively. So they're putting in, you know, a more effort, like an effort which is constantly in the making and modified and growing constantly for them to be able to know the environment, pick up the cues from the environment and accordingly communicate with um, everybody around. And communication and speaking, again, during the nine to 36 months of age, um, it can be verbal, it can be nonverbal. Also, they're able to engage others in interaction and able to engage themselves in interaction with the others. And using, you know, every day, we see that they're using more and more complex words. And not only are they using, I mean, this is something so amazing to see that they are using and applying them very, very, very effectively, which is the most, um, I would say in, in our life's journey as a teacher and caregiver or as parents to see this gradual growth in the child and as they grow and develop is, is honestly a very, um, you know, like awesome thing to be able to be part of a child's everyday life and seeing them develop and grow. Um, under vocabulary development, by between nine to 36 months, they understand um, more words and increasing number and as also it, it brings them to the level of knowing more words and um, carrying on conversation with others, applying those. Um, they also learn how to say rhymes and repetitions and that, that, that's the time where we can introduce all these things, you know, music and activities, nursery rhymes, um, repetitive activities, um, something, you know, like one of my favorite is Dr. Seuss. I mean, I think again, in my opinion, nobody is there, you know, anything that what we see in Dr. Seuss. And I think those picture books, sometimes you are amazed to see that children actually, they, they look at the book and they can, even though they can read, but they can literally say the whole, you know, repeat the whole book. And that is the beauty of books like that, that how this acquisition happens gradually, but they learn how to apply these words. Also, they, you know, this is also a perfect time for us to get them acquainted with books. And as we say, you know, books, there is no hard and fast time where we can read to a child or when we can introduce books to the children. Some mothers prefer reading um, when the child is not even born, before they are born. And relating having the kids exposure to books, reading books, retelling the stories, and having you know um, access to different kinds of books also um, helps them a great way in their vocabulary acquisition. And, and I think you know that kind of lays the steps towards further progress and their academic success because children who are being read at, uh, on a regular day and who have access to books, um, it shows that does have an effect. And I've seen it when I was a teacher that having exposure of books and also one thing I learned at Head Start is keeping books at different centers. That is one thing. So books are not confined just to the reading corner. They're also kept in little baskets or little, you know, like little bins in, at different centers. So to give you an example, at a home living area, a child maybe, or a couple of kids, depending on the number of kids that are assigned to that center, they may be playing directly, but then there would be one child who may be just sitting down and reading books on cooking, menus, visit to the marketplace, shopping at the grocery store. So, you know, development and learning is happening at each stage. So books play a very, very uh, important role in language and vocabulary acquisition. So emergent lit literacy between nine and 36 months, they recognize pictures, they recognize the symbols, signs, and, and the words that are associated with the sounds, they're able to you know, just understand the meaning of a story from the picture 
and stories. They can relate and have the interconnection between the two. Um, also at this age, um, you know, you, you have them uh, access to writing materials and crayons and markers, and they're able to make um, at random marks, which actually in their mind represent some objects or actions. And as we know, you know, if we interpret the drawings of children as they're growing and we see at a regular rate how the growth and development happens when, you know, when there is like a little circle and some sticks, as time goes on, how it takes the shape of a human being. Initially, they may not be placed um, at the right positions, but over the period of time, you know, there is in, in their little mind and their brain, they are trying to express themselves in their own little ways. But again, this is also a part of the development. And then between 36 to 16 months, um, they are able to not only comprehend, apply vocabulary, say it, but they're also able to communicate and carry on a conversation with others. You know, they can they can literally you can have a back and forth, um, you know, conversation with them on on any topic. They understand and they respond to more complex language as well. This is another thing. As they grow on, there is more a vocabulary or new words that are added. And that's one of the reason why we do, you know, we have word wall in the classroom. We have books available. We read to them, preferably once. Or I prefer always like at least twice. Um, uh, circle time is a great time during the day to do small group activities or any large group activities. Transition times can be great um, opportunities to help children develop their language and literacy skills. Um, communicating and speaking, they use information um, to meet the demands of the situation, which means they are able to read and comprehend, understand the cues or what is happening around them, which is another vital thing, the connection between the real world and what they're learned and they're learning or they're being exposed to. Because the purpose of our education is to make the children, you know, ready for the environment that they are in, to be able to make and see how they relate their learning to the actual world, how it is effective and how they're able to comprehend and use that, that meaning or their knowledge into that situation. They follow, um, not only do they understand, but now they're able to follow, understand and follow to social uh, norms and rules. And as we say in our classroom, that is one of the reason when we introduce rules, I always love having children to be part of the rules because making them part of the rules also makes them to be, um, makes them to be accountable because when you are part of something, then you feel like you have an ownership towards it. So keep it simple, keep it um, short, but give them ample opportunities to practice it. And I always say this to my teachers that rules are not set in stone. So please, please have an open mind to change them as you go along because your children are, are able to, they are the ones who are telling you if they have um, understood and mastered something, always feel free to add some more challenges, add little steps towards it, make it a little more complex for them. And they're able to express themselves. That is also one key thing, providing them with multiple opportunities in the classroom throughout the day to be able to have self-expression in the classroom, be it telling stories, writing, drawing, music and movement, uh, playing at the centers, playing outside. Uh, play can be used as a very important and integral tool in the classroom as well. So 36 to uh, 60 months, they understand a wide variety of, of vocabulary and words. If we you know, think about the slide that I have shared with you at the beginning of this and the word, they understand words that go together the relationship between the different words. And they are able to, again, not only understand it, but able to apply it as well. Uh, phonological awareness. So what is phonological awareness? Um, it, it, it is that 
the the sound that goes with you know like the letter a ah uh, and ah so so the so understanding what goes with the letter sound and having demonstrating the awareness for the spoken language and understanding that it is comprised of different smaller segments of sounds which being put together is what makes up the words the words make up the sentences and the and and that's what is also one of the you know important stage of growth and development between this um, time frame, 36 to 60 months. Alphabet and print knowledge, they understand how print is used and how it works. So when they can get the, understand or comprehend the phonological awareness and they're able to identify the letters and the sounds that go with it. And that's why, you know, it is important to introduce rhyming words, um, you know, um, opposite words, um, you know, words that go together and have them done not only like orally and verbally, but create some uh, simple um, exercises or activities, which, you know, I'm a big favorite of not buying everything from the store, but making little things that you can create with uh, materials that are readily available and putting it together. All it takes maybe like a little cookie sheet that you have and, and materials that you can have um, I used to make uh, like lessons for young kids, like uh, buy some stuff after Christmas, like acorns and apples, and then having them to identify first the objects to go with the sound, then have a little basket with the objects and then uh, cards to go with it. The first initial thing was, uh, you know, identifying, um, I also identifying the sound and then matching the object with it. And then as it progresses or I progress based on their individual level of um, acquisition and ability and their stages or, or uh, developmental stages, um, I would go along and add little more challenge to it. And I've seen, you know, something that kids do hands-on always works better because when you do something with your, with your hand, it actually helps you to retain better. And you, it, it seems to um, have the kids better engaged and have more uh, interest in them, which is you know, one of the key things that we should always be um, careful about is engagement. Comprehension and text structure. So they, so they understand like when they're able to listen to a story and able to retell the story, that is also understanding and it is comprehension skill that is also developing. Always ask open-ended questions uh, from the book when you read to them and, and have them opportunities to ask questions as well to their, to their peers, um, discussing it and create an environment where children feel safe, children feel comfortable. It's in a non-judgmental way. There is no right and wrong involvement and they are always there to be able to express themselves freely. Writing also, I believe, you know, from a very early age, you should have materials available and accessible, readily accessible to the children where they can have access to it whenever they choose to. And they um, have opportunities to try the skill, able to make scribble scrabbles. And then as they go along and mature enough, their skill develops and um, you know improves farther, they go into writing. So writing skill, I think should go hand in hand with reading and vocabulary and having exposure to um, the classroom centers and materials. Um, the dual language learners or DLL. Now, this is something like we don't have it all the times, but with the, um, you know, the diverse population that we see and we serve, at our, at our centers, at our schools. Um, it's always good to know some basics um, or understanding how the development happens in dual language learners. So we need to understand that the, that the development of language and vocabulary is a little bit different maybe the main, than the mainstream because it is not only uh, the child's ability and the interest, but also the kind of environment that the child is in. How, how, what kind of temperament does the child have? Is it a shy child? 
Is the child too much inside an introvert child? How do we engage that child? How do we have, provide them with opportunities so they slowly open up and they get engaged? And, and the support that is received, not only at home, I mean, I'm sorry, not only at the school, but also at home. And that is one thing um, we have to have and which I'm gonna talk about uh, in the next slide about parent engagement. And um, so these children usually tend to learn when they're learning both languages, they will switch between the two languages. So that is one thing very common. You should uh, be aware of it. Um, some of these children may not make eye contacts. And that is one thing I just want to share my personal experiences. Some cultures do not tend to promote or accept when an adult is talking to look straight in the eye, but to kind of have your look down. And I have seen, and I always talk about this with my teachers when I train them that please don't take it as a sign of defiance because this child is used to that kind of uh, behavior or expectations at home where they're not used to. So as you go slowly, you can on, uh, you know, support, provide guidance, and let the child know that it is okay to do it, that you can talk to someone while looking up at them. Um, and also provide enough opportunities for them to pair them up with another child, to be able to uh, give opportunities for them to participate actively um, and, and slowly be patient, be caring, be loving, provide them with the guidance and the support as they, were, uh, they are acquiring new skills to learn two languages. Um, and they, you know, at one stage, it's amazing that you will find that these kids catch up and they're able to have vocabulary which is almost close to or similar to the other children that are part of the classroom and um, also help them to recognize and use written forms of both languages, which is also uh, the effective way because first and foremost, we got to create an environment which is safe, which is comfortable for the children, where they feel that they're being valued and welcomed and, and then provide them slowly opportunities so they can open up, they can blossom and they can feel comfortable to be able to participate and be engaged. Um, and supporting them is also like provide opportunities to hear and experience both languages. Like one of my experiences like um, I had in the classroom uh, two different uh, little crates decorated by the children. One had English books, one had Spanish books. And I would, I would request my parents if they could provide us 10 minutes anytime, like during pickup or maybe in the morning during drop off, um, while the, a group of kids have already finished having their breakfast, the other group is just sitting down, maybe uh, engaged in an activity to read a book. It didn't matter if it was a Spanish book or an English book because kids listen to it anyway. And that was a direct parent engagement, which didn't take too much time. It was doable for my working parents as well. And I got an amazing response from my parents who were very happy to do it. So, you know, exposing every child to different languages is actually a long-term, you know, it has a benefit. Um, and do not force them, push them, they can still be maintaining their home language and feel comfortable to be able to go back and forth if I'm unable to understand because I admit I do not speak Spanish, but I would get someone to be able to understand what the child is saying for him or her to feel comfortable to be able to communicate and involve and engage parents. As we say, parents are the best teachers. We cannot do anything without having parent engagement. And, and what a great way for us to get parents engaged and making them involved, making them feel welcome at our programs. And, and it can serve and help children of both languages. Um, some of the activities that I would now discuss, and I know you all are doing it in your classroom, um, on a regular routine basis, which can help the children. So like we said before, I have, I have also discussed, um, you know, activities of when you talk to them, like repetitive sounds, 
This is for the infants. Always make an eye contact with them when you are, even including while well, maybe you are changing the diaper or you are feeding the child, make an eye contact and, and constantly have that back and forth conversation and the child will respond to you, reciprocating to you as well. Be responsive. So responsive caregiving is a very important term. What do we understand by responsive caregiving? We are responding to the need of this child. That could be crying, that could be cooing, that could be trying to reach out. But at that point, being responsive or responding to the child provides the child that comfort and that assurance. So by being responsive is not only literally feeding them, changing them, but it's also um, understanding the cue and responding to the child who is trying to communicate or reach out to you. Um, imitate the actions like playing games like a peekaboo and then clapping. And you will see even when little babies, when they're able to sit up and, and you have a, a music on, they will just go swing back and forth to the rhythm. You know, their bodies is tuned in a way where they respond to it. So playing these kind of games and, and engaging them in music and um, you know, uh, clapping exercises, rhymes, this also helps in the language acquisition. Read to the children. At that stage, you know, variety of books like the soft books, like the cloth books, like you know, books with different like zippers and Velcro, making sounds, uh, picture books, all these exposure to these books. So make it a habit to read to the children every day. Um, also, you know, kids would sometimes um, try to point out, and when they do, or you point out to something, um, name that object, what is it? And as you go on, like we say, repetition or practice makes it perfect. The child is gonna understand and associate that name with the object eventually. And frequent conversation, I cannot even say how much interaction and meaningful back and forth conversation is important and an integral part of our child development, not only in vocabulary and language skill development, but I would say in all domains. Another one that is one of my pet peeve is social emotional development. So engagement in back and forth conversation actually helps the children in their social and emotional skill development as well. Um, activities that we can engage the toddlers in. Um, always, like I said, keep your rules simple, shorter, make it clear, and have the children to give you signs or repeat it so you understand their understanding, what is your expectations, because if we don't do it, how do we understand? Kids are understanding it. Rules can be there, they can be on the wall, it can be discussed, but how do we make sure or ensure that kids are understanding it? Repeat what the child says. That is another thing. Not only would you engage the child in repetition or repeating what you said, but you repeat like we do at the end of a meeting, maybe we summarize just to see and, and make sure that we are both on the same page. And when a child says maybe a, a small one or two words, we can say it and expand it into a sentence and get the child engaged in that conversation because as we do it, the child is able to comprehend and understand and eventually they will get how to use that word effectively in a sentence. And always like asking open-ended question is one part, but also encouraging the children um, and, and to, to ask questions as well and always ask a who, why, how question, which technically does not have one answer is also a key thing for all kinds of developments for children at that age. Um, you know, use different music, activities, songs, books, puppets, role play. What a wonderful tool it is, a role play in the classroom where you can engage the little bit older kids to, to play a role. Like you read a book and then have the kids a choice to pick up a character and then play the role. And, and it, is, it is such a wonderful tool for the children to be able to um, act out and able to participate being engaged as well as there is a constant vocabulary and language skill development as well. Um, for preschoolers, as they grow and mature, 
you are able to be responsive to their needs. So being a good listener and paying good attention to what they are trying to say or comprehend is also a very, very important because we need to acknowledge them um, when they're making an attempt to say something or sometimes the cue may be nonverbal. So we know each and every child, we know their capabilities, we know uh, the, their rate of development and growth. So our, our utmost job is to meet the individual need of every child. And for that, we need to pay attention, be a good listener, provide them uh, opportunities to communicate, ask questions, um, also model conversation. Like, you know, when you say something, um, don't correct them or overcorrect, but say the right form. So as they listen, even that listening is also important for them. Um, you know, requesting children to repeat the directions. Um, simple, like I say again, that keep it simple, keep it short, so that children are able to comprehend it and apply it. Um, variety of books should be available. You should at least have some time, even provide opportunities for the children to just sit quiet at the reading corner and just pick up a book. I mean, they can flip through the pages, they can look through a picture book, they can make up their own stories. How many times have you seen a child with a book and, and flipping over the pages and saying the story loud by himself or herself? That's the beauty of it. If you see something like that, you know for sure that you're doing a great job. Give yourself a big pat on the back. Uh, play, play different kinds of games, role playing, dramatic play. Dramatic play or home living area plays a very, very um, important role or an integral role in language skill development and social emotional skill development. The children, when you, when you, if you can observe and kind of like, you know, later on just kind of assess the situation, you will be amazed to see what kind of learning is, is happening at a dramatic play area. So always make sure to change the materials. And as a, as a rule of thumb, I always believe that um, recycling your class equipment and materials is also very important. So when the kids come, maybe if you choose to change it every week or every other week, so make sure to do it like on a Friday. So when the kids come back on Monday morning, they're almost like amazed to see, oh, look at that. There's, there's this puzzle that was not there. and they take a new interest in, in playing and working with it. So that is also a very important part. Um, using books, so nothing can, I, can, I can say, I mean, nothing can be said or we cannot say enough how effective books are. So read to them every day, um, like you can engage your parents, you can engage, um, you know, some, if you have volunteers to come in and, and have, they're being reading to the children um, and also make, make reading fun and interesting and interactive. Like if you can modulate your voice and, and just act out, there are so many ways. You can use a puppet to go with books. Children can create a puppet with simple things like a sock or a brown paper bag, a lunch bag. And, and when, like I said, when you have hands-on experiences associated with uh, real life experience, children always learn better because you know they remember when they do something with their own hands and create something. So invite the children to retell the stories, to pretend uh, role-playing the characters. Um, one of my favorite thing was like um, some very simple stories. I would ask the children at the end of reading the story that, um, okay, so how does the story end? What happens at the end of the story? And they will say something. So I would say, hmm, the story ends like this. Can anyone think of a different ending maybe? And how amazing it is. These kids are so wonderful. They come up with an ending or come up with multiple endings, which are amazing. And that's when we think like, oh my God, what kind of thought process goes in their brain that they are able to, um, you know, make stories up and able to just take it to another different level? And yes, they do it. And then, not, you know, last but not the least, have a variety of books available. And like the idea, I 
I picked up and learned from Head Start, having books kept at different centers. I think that's a great idea. You may have books in your, in your closet or storage lying there that have not been used at, at your school or program that you could just kind of go through it and then take a little clear plastic bin or box and just put books. You will be seeing how much interest the children take it when you put them at different uh, centers. It's just a thought. Um, this is something I'm going to just read it. I know it may sound a little boring, but I love this quote from Richard Gentry, um, Raising confidential, uh, confidential Readers. It says, parents should begin reading aloud to children at birth. It feeds the child's hungry brain with data of language development, speaking, and early word reading. It's a wonderful way to bond and leads to cognitive, social, and emotional development, which is another thing. Language development is closely related, goes hand in hand with social and emotional skill development because I believe that if we can have a, a, like a stable foundation for social emotional skill development, those children will fare very well in their lives. Of all the domains of early childhood development, I think that's one of the most important domain that we need to uh, pay attention to as parents, as caregivers, as teachers. And so books are reading are wonderful tool and simple to do it and use on a daily basis for children's language, vocabulary, and um, reading skill development. So these are some of the practices that I would um, just briefly discuss about. Um, sometimes, you know, like you can read together when you are doing it. Um, a writing, uh, writing area is also a vital part of language acquisition. So provide uh, materials that are different variety of materials that are accessible to the children, um, engaging in open-ended and two-way conversation using new words, like some of you may be using, introducing a word of the week, or you have a word wall and see how many words children can come up with um, and repeat the words, let them, let them learn and let them repeat it. Um, what, two things that I would also recommend, do not use baby talk. That is one thing that you should refrain from and do not correct them when they're saying something maybe in fragmented um, you know, or words or that may not be grammatically correct. So just say the right form. So that way the children will eventually learn what would be the correct form. Nursery rhymes, alphabet songs, music and movement, clapping to the rhythm, clapping to the syllables, you know. Um, well, I, I, I remember one song, it's not coming with the little rabbit thing that um, kids, you take off some words and you hum the word. I mean, what a wonderful way of having the children to learn rhythm and um, you know songs and, and syllables and stuff like that. Um, add a variety of music because music has no boundaries. You can use music from different parts of the world. It can be songs, it can be instrumental music that you can use in your classroom. And, and add simple, like children can sway like a little bandana or they can have like some, something like a streamer or just kind of go along, you know, go fast, go slow, um, move to the sound of the music, go forward, go backward. There could be so many different ways to engage the children in music. And, and like I said, music has no boundaries. You can even request your parents, if you have parents from other parts of the world, to bring in and share some kind of music with them, which is ethnic and regional. So that could be another opportunity to expose your children to different kinds of music. And play. There's a whole lot of training that can be done on play, which can be a combination of structure, and child initiated, so play can be teacher, teacher initiated and child initiated as well. So you have to know your children, understand their cues, be a good listener, know their interests, able to read that the, you know, what they're trying to tell you sometimes through verbal uh, words or sometimes through nonverbal way of communicating 
and you can engage them in play, which can be um, a great tool for language acquisition. But always keep in mind though, that um, there should be a balance between the teacher created and the child initiated play. So create a balance, like everything that you tell um, it, or versus you just let the kids go, whatever they want to do. So none of these scenarios are, are you know, positive. So if you can, and for that, you need planning to do. You need to choose your activities. What would go with your team for that particular week is also very, very important. So planning and organization is also um, important and necessary when you are doing it. Um, babies like books, you know, which has colorful pictures, sounds, different kinds of textures, um, nursery rhymes, lullabies, uh, repeating sounds. So kids, uh, at that age are more like touchy, feely, huggy type. And if you give them exposure to those kind of books, they love it. Toddlers books love the books that they can manage and hold it. And again, rhyme, rhyming um, books, repetition, like Dr. Seuss, again, it comes up, love it. About items and when they can associate and you know what they're reading or or looking at the pictures with what is happening or around them that that just kind of also interests them a lot and books that have like flaps and zippers and sounds and different kinds of music are also uh, something that interests the toddlers as well preschoolers like books like simple stories you know that are engaging that are funny that they are able to kind of like uh, see that, oh, mm -hmm, this is the story of a boy or a little girl. Um, it's almost like me. So I can, uh, I can see myself and there are things that I see around me. So that, that has text, um, you know, the stories are easy to remember. So many times we have seen kids don't know how to read, but they can say the whole, they can repeat the whole story. Amazing. And, um, Variety of books should be available. Different kinds of books that they have exposure to are also very important part of um, having the preschoolers to be able to um, acquire uh, or develop their language and vocabulary skills. Um, so for early literacy development, what are some of the things that are, are important that we should be mindful about as we create um, you know, our, um, our themes, our uh, curriculum, our um, schedule for the for the week. So we need to be careful so we can have these that are part of the early literacy development, like alphabet knowledge, that kids have the opportunity to know their alphabets, the sounds that go with it. Um, you know, so they initially they would learn to go in order like A, B, C, D, but then eventually when they master that you can have them exposed to a random pickup and see if they're able to um, you know, recognize and say it. Um, print knowledge, oral language vocabulary, which is you are constantly talking to them like your word wall, your word of the week, new word that you introduce um, is important. Print knowledge, you know, if we, if we look around, like uh, that is another thing that I have learned um, at Head Start. They will have a poster board uh, created by the kids, which is called environmental prints. And what we see there are things that are that are evident, like say for a grocery store that's in town, there's a logo of the grocery store. There's like, uh, just to give you a few examples, McDonald's, there is like traffic lights, things like that the kids see around. So what it does, you can have the pictures. Um, this can be created by the kids themselves. That could be a great kind of like an art opportunity for the kids to um, cut kids who have the skill for cutting the scissors or they may be tearing it with their uh, little fingers and you make it and as you kind of extend it or expand it, you can use or, or have words underneath that. This could be a great tool where it can be placed somewhere accessible and visible for the children and children can go in and look at it and sit there and say it by themselves and also provide them opportunities where they can do visual processing 
of the knowledge that they're getting about prints and alphabets. And this is all combined together, which actually helps the children in their reading readiness. And I have seen it, I will be honest with you, sharing my own story with my kids and doing all these things that I practice with my children. Um, I never had to sim you know, like drill anything for them. It happened. And I, I believe strongly that when you expose the children to these kind of experiences, environmentally rich, print rich, vocabulary rich, um, through activities, it, it creates an environment that children are like um, soaking the knowledge from a variety of sources. And that is one of our key goal of uh, providing an environment, helping the children to be able to gather skills um, for language and literacy development. Um, so family and school connection, like I've said before, I mean, we cannot do or help the children in their learning journey without the parents. And for that, it's very, very, very important to know your parents, respect, make them feel welcome and develop a relationship. It's like a bond. You know, if you have that kind of a relationship, it's going to also help you to understand the child better. So a positive teacher child, I mean, sorry, teacher parent relationship is also very, very important and uh, provide uh, teacher uh, families opportunities to have access to different kind of resources. It could be uh, community resources, it could be resources, say, for example, in a toddler class, it could be resources on biting, which is one of the very, um, you know, issues that we face almost in all toddler classrooms. So things like that, potty training, something that interests the parents that you can even have access to, like you can have a little magazine holder in your parent area or outside your infant toddler class or toddler classroom, and you can let the parents know and they can pick up the information whenever they choose to. Or I have seen like monthly newsletter uh, that can be shared online through email, or you can have a website for your program where this month we are um, discussing about, um, you know, uh, Biden, or the next month we are talking about um, you know, fussy eaters, some topic is just at random. So you can, depending on the need of your, of your parents and your program, you can choose. And these are the different ways that you can engage the parents. Always have an open communication channel with the parents so you can provide them with uh, knowledge or parents always feel comfortable to come and uh, provide you with the knowledge. There could be, you know, temporarily you may see a uh, you know, a different behavior in a child and the child normally doesn't behave that way. So what could be the reason? The reason could be that um, there may be something happening at home uh, which has affected uh, the child. So in that case, that open communication with your parent goes a long way. Um, you can provide um, resources for parent-child activity, something simple the parent can do, um, that could be another uh, form of family engagement. Um, we used to have a little library um, at our center for parents to check out books on a Friday. And it was done exactly like um, any library. Kids were in the classroom, we discussed about how do we take care of the books. We don't tear them, we don't uh, write on them. We take good care and we share the books. When I'm done with it, I'm gonna bring it back and so my friend can check it out. So that could be another, another little thing that you could do uh, in your classroom or you could do it as a program itself. So these are just some, some ways to engage parents. Um, these are some of the resources that I gathered for uh, providing to the parents um, that would provide them with um, information, activities on how to develop language and literacy skills in children. And um, parents, some parents appreciate it so much. Some young new parents who don't know where to look for, this could be a great um, you know, resource for the parents as well. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, contact me. My contact um, email is mila.earlychildhood 
at gmail.com. So I would be happy to assist you or um, provide you with any additional information or if you have any questions regarding this training. Um, these are my reference pages that I have um, consulted and honestly valuable information. Um, I love this little uh, thing. It, the facets of language acquisition. If, we, if you kind of take a brief moment to look at it and it's in bold language. And then there are all the little words that are there. If you read through them and it, it's kind of fascinates you to see how language development is happening and what are some of the things that comprise of this whole journey towards vocabulary and language skill development in young children. I simply wanted to share this with you and uh, I hope that I have been able to communicate information that is of interest to you, that you would be able to use and apply in your classroom. And um, it, it would have been wonderful if we could have met face to face and I would have live audience, but I would honestly love to um, know if you can contact me and let me know if there is anything that you have been able to gather from this training that you think you can effectively use in your classroom. And with this, I would like to conclude my training today. And I honestly thank you all. And I thank um, Ms. Shipley for this opportunity. And um, I'm looking forward to more opportunities where I can share my knowledge and experience with you. Thank you. Mila, wonderful work. Mila also has another um, session, if you would like to go look for that. And that is also recorded and housed right here on this YouTube channel. Have a great day.